Hey everyone, it's violin time. My name is Daniel Bartholomew Poiser. I'm the principal education conductor of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And today you're gonna to have an excellent lesson with Wendy Rose, who's one of the wonderful violinists in our Toronto Symphony Orchestra. She's gonna be teaching you so much about the instrument. Violin, as you know, I mean, it's such a versatile instrument used in so many different types of music from all over the world, no matter where you're from, what kind of music you love, violin can be part of it. So we're so excited that you've decided to join us today with hundreds, maybe thousands of students from all over Ontario to learn from Wendy about how to take the instrument out of the case, how to, how to, how to work with the chin rest, how to, how to use the bow properly, how to take care of it, and how to get set up on your way for a wonderful musical journey. Also, she teaches you a little bit about this. Hmm, what's that going to be about? Well, you're going to find out. So, if you have questions at the end of this lesson, please be sure to contact us at schoolconcerts at tso.ca. At schoolconcerts at tso.ca. And we will do our best to get back to you and to have your questions answered. But now, take a deep breath and be prepared to begin your journey on the violin. Pay attention and have fun. everybody and welcome to my sound advice tutorial on how to play the violin. I'm so happy you could join me here today so I can share some tips with you and hopefully make this experience a little more fun and exciting. But before we even get to the violin, I'd like to show you this elastic band that I brought here with me today. If you happen to have an elastic band nearby, you might want to consider pausing this video and running to get it so perhaps you could do this experiment with me. If you don't have one, no worries. You can always do this later on your own if you'd like to. So, have you ever noticed that when you stretch an elastic band and pluck it, it wiggles back and forth very quickly? It's making vibrations, and these vibrations actually produce sound waves. And if you listen very carefully, you'll notice that the sound waves are making musical notes. What's more, the tighter you pull the elastic band, the higher the pitch. Which means that you can actually make little melodies on an elastic band. Isn't that cool? I used to do that all the time when I was a kid. Try simple melodies like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Mary Had a Little Lamb. You might have fun doing that on your own if you'd like to. So the reason I brought this elastic band and did this demonstration with you is because violins actually make sound pretty much the same way. As you know, there are four strings on a violin, and the highest string is the E string. That's the string that's also pulled the tightest, which is why the pitch is the highest. So I think we're almost ready to start learning how to make sounds on the violin ourselves. But first, I'd like to show you how to set up a violin and bow correctly. So this is my violin case. It's black and it's shaped like a violin. Yours may look very similar, but I also have two other cases at home and those are rectangular and shaped on the inside. Both kinds of cases are very popular with students and professionals alike. So not to worry, yours can look like either and you can change your mind over the years and switch it up. So the thing about the violin is that it can seem pretty overwhelming at first. I mean, you have to learn how to hold it with your left hand, then you have to put the bow on the right hand, you have to coordinate the two. It can really feel quite confusing at times. So I thought we'd keep things simple and start with just picking up the violin. As you know, the violin has a long neck and that's the part that you should pick the violin up with. You can also put your other hand on the chin rest to balance if you'd like. 
but you should try to avoid touching the surface of the violin. It's actually very delicate and can scratch quite easily. So when you're picking up the violin or putting it away, always secure your hand under the neck. The part closest to the pegs is probably the best part to use. And when you're not playing the violin, get in the habit of putting it back in the case the same way. It's really best not to leave it hanging around. I don't know about you, but I have two cats at home and there's nothing they like better than to curiously poke at my violin. I don't want to run that risk. I always put my violin away and I even close the case so that they can't get to it. You might want to get in the same habit. So you may have noticed that at the back of my violin, I have what we call a shoulder rest. Most violinists do something to help secure the violin in place when they're holding it. There are a wide variety of devices that you can use. Some people simply use a cloth so that the violin doesn't slip. Other people use pads similar to this. I use this kind of shoulder rest, but there are many, many different kinds. And over the years, you're going to want to experiment with all sorts of devices to see what works best for you. I could do a whole tutorial just on shoulder rests. It takes a long time to figure out what's most comfortable. Don't get discouraged and allow yourself to change your mind. So how do we attach these things? Well, if you're using a pad, I'm going to use this handkerchief as an example, but any sort of sponge or pad would work just fine. You're going to put it at the back of the violin. You're going to take an elastic band. You're going to use the edge of the violin to secure the elastic band. Pull it tight and see where there's like a little end pin here. The elastic band will wrap very nicely around there and help secure whatever you've put at the back in place. If you're using a shoulder rest, you'll notice that the shoulder rest, whatever brand you're using, has some sort of feet. The feet attach to the edge over here on one side, and then you put it in an angle and sort of slide the other side carefully in place, and then pull back a little bit so that it's secure. These shoulder rests can move. They can be pushed in one direction and then in the other direction as well. And that too takes a lot of experimentation because you might prefer it more at one side or the other. It will really be a question of what fits your anatomy best. Again, a lot of experimentation. Don't get discouraged. So the next step, I'm going to put my violin away, holding by the neck as I showed you. The next step is the bow. So in my case, I happen to have two bows. One is more than enough. I just happen to have a spare. The bows either slide out at the end near the frog, the heavier square part, or there might be a little clip that you have to turn. Mine turns with a clip. I'm holding the frog very carefully, sliding the tip out, and then picking up the bow. The tip of the bow is actually quite fragile. It's best to try to hold the bow any way you can, even holding your bow as a fist right now is just fine. And learning to be very, very gentle with it. Bows are very fragile and can break. When you put the bow back in the case, Tip first, slide it into the slot, attach the frog, and you'll notice some cases ask for the bow, especially if you're using the upper slot. They want the bow upside down. Others want the bow right side up. Every case is a little different. You might want to ask your teacher if you're uncertain or just experiment yourself. You should never force the bow. It should go in properly. Mine at the top goes in upside down. The bottom slot goes right side up. And I turn the little clip. The next step in preparing a bow for playing is to use the rosin. 
Do you have a cake of rosin in the little pocket of your case? It looks like this. Mine is black, some of them are yellow, some are round, some are square. Not to worry, they all serve the same function, which is to allow for some friction on the bow hairs. Now, before we actually put the rosin on the bow, I want to talk a little bit about the bow hairs. Here is my bow when it's first come out of the case. As you can see, I have a big dip, big arc in my bow, and the hairs are fairly loose. That is the way I store my bow in the case. The reason for that is because our houses are actually generally quite dry, especially in the winter time. The stick of the bow is made of wood and the wood can contract. And if that happens, the stick can become very straight and there's a risk that it would snap. So in the case, you want it very loose. Out of the case, you use the screw to tighten it. Works just like a regular screw. Clockwise will tighten it. Counterclockwise will loosen it. You want to tighten the bow so that the hairs are not touching the stick. But you don't want to tighten too much to get a straight stick because again, that might cause the bow to snap. Always get in the habit of loosening the bow when you put it back in the case. For now, I'm going to make sure that I have the right distance between the stick and the hairs. Looks good to me and I'm ready for the rosin. So if you've ever watched the Olympics, you might have noticed that gymnasts use rosin on their hands to secure a grip on the apparatus that they're using. We need sticky stuff on the hairs because then they can grab the strings of the violin, allowing the strings to vibrate. And that, as you know, is what produces the sound. So the best way to apply the rosin is to concentrate on the area at the frog and the area at the tip. What I generally do is something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight at the frog, slide it all the way to the tip. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight slide it back again and maybe do one or two long strokes for good luck and we're ready to go next step how to hold the violin how to hold the bow one of the best ways to practice holding the violin is to stand in front of a big mirror so you can see yourself if you don't have one available no worries I'll try to give you some tips on how to do it correctly. So the first thing you want to do is establish good posture. That means your feet are going to be hip width in front of you, just maybe a foot between each of your two feet, balanced on both feet. And you might want to turn your left foot at what I would call a 45 degree angle. For those of you not sure what that is, it's not straight, it's not completely to the side, but halfway in between. With that foot turned at that angle, when you place the violin, your arm is going to be aligned with that left foot. So, two things to bear in mind. Where do you hold the violin? Let's start with your hand underneath the neck towards the pegs. Later on, you'll learn how to move your hand up and down, but for now, this is the best way to put your hand. Fairly secure, not squeezing, but not too loose, so that you can balance the weight of the violin under your neck. And now you wanna know how do you put the violin under your neck? Well, you probably have a chin rest, and here's the thing. Why is it called a chin rest? It doesn't go under our chin. It actually goes under our left jawbone. Fits just comfortably under there. If you're using a pad or a shoulder rest, that part is going to straddle your shoulder. You're going to put it up against your neck. Your jawbone is going to sit 
gently, again, not squeezing, but with just enough weight so that you can balance the violin between your jawbone and your hand, like this. Now, you want your left hand to be fairly straight in line with your arm. Your fingers are going to be curved and you're going to have to angle your hand just a little bit so that your pinky finger is still hovering over the strings or able to push down the strings along with your other finger. As for the thumb, the thumb is going to be a little bit in back of your hand. And for the time being, it's going to be fairly straight, but again, not squeezing. Your thumb will probably move when you play, but this is a good starting position. So here's the overall position. In all likelihood, if your violin fits you properly, it's going to form a gentle V with your arm. If the violin is a little bit too big for you, it may look a little bit more like this. You'll grow into the violin. Don't worry about it if there's no smaller violin available for you at the moment. So let's go over it again. You've got good posture, left foot at a 45 degree angle, left arm in line with the left foot, straight hand, fairly straight or slightly curved thumb on the other side, fingers over the strings, and you're ready to go. So let's put our violins away for the time being and learn how to hold the bow correctly. Do you have a pencil handy nearby? You might want to pause the video for a sec and try to grab one. I always find it easier if I can practice a bow grip on a pencil first. I'm going to move in a little closer. You can see what I'm doing. Line the first knuckles of each finger up against the pencil. And now place your pinky on top of the pencil like this. Curve your fingers around that first joint and place your thumb underneath, slightly bent. You might want to place your thumb in between the index and middle finger, like this. Now, if you put a little bit of pressure on the pinky, the pencil is going to move in one direction. With pressure on the index finger, it's going to move in the other direction, kind of like a seesaw. See if you can practice the seesaw movement. Now let's try it with the bow. Pick up your bow gently. Align your fingers the same way. Pinky on top. Now the thumb is actually going to go in this little curved section. Bent and with the tip kind of half off that little curved section and half on. Try a different angle like this. Some teachers will prefer that you start with your thumb under the frog. That's fine too. You'll still want the thumb bent with the fingers wrapped around it the way I suggested. I'm going to put my thumb back in that curved area, wrap my fingers around the first knuckle, make sure my pinky's on top, and angle my fingers a little bit to the left like this. If I have the weight balanced between my pinky and my index, I'll be able to let go. And I'm going to start by moving the bow vertically. Again, practice alternating the pressure between the pinky and the index and see if you can wave the bow back and forth. A little bit more pressure on the index and we can get back to a horizontal position like this. Now you'll notice you have to make sure you have a fair amount of weight on the pinky to maintain that balance. See if you can still do the seesaw movement. It's a lot harder on the bow, isn't it? But when you have the violin strings underneath, it will actually be a little bit easier to maintain that balance. Now we're going to put away the bows and we'll 
see if we can put the two together and make a sound. And now we start to make some beautiful sounds. Let's pick up our violins and assume the correct position. No clutching with the palm, but a nice straight line. No squeezing of the neck and shoulders. Just a nice, comfortable, balanced position. The first thing we're going to do is to pluck the open strings. That's called pizzicato, as many of you already know. We'll start with the G string. Using your index finger, place it on the fingerboard, that's the black part over the neck. Curl the finger slightly and use the inside tip portion to gently pull the string away from you. It should produce a nice ringing sound. You need to experiment a bit. Too much pressure and it's going to sound loud and aggressive. Too little, it might be too soft. So let's try this again. And when you're happy with the result, you can move on to the D string, the A string, and the E string. And now it's time to use our bows. We're going to pick up our bows, assume the correct bow position. Remember, you don't want your fingers too close together or too far apart, just with a nice little space between each of them. And you're going to place your bow in the middle between the bridge and the fingerboard, like this. That's called the sounding point, and that's where we produce the nicest sound. So the first thing you want to do is feel balanced there. So placing the bow, Try to make sure it's parallel to the bridge, like that, and that your right shoulder isn't shrugging, but is nice and relaxed and giving you just enough weight that you'll be able to produce a good sound. Let's try a little experiment first by rolling the bow between the G string and the E string, like this. Excellent. And now we're ready to actually make a sound. Let's start with the E string for this one. And we're going to start at the frog. Placing the bow at the frog, we're going to roll our fingers a little bit away from us so that we're a little bit on the edge of the hair. The reason we're doing that is because the frog is quite heavy. And if you use the flat of the hair, at the frog, it's going to sound kind of crunchy. As you move the bow towards the tip, you can begin to flatten the hair. So let's put our bows halfway between the bridge and the fingerboard and simply pull our right arm down. Did you manage to stay on the string? It takes a while to get used to it. The biggest hint I can give you is that you really want to keep your bow parallel to the frog, uh, to the bridge. Too much in one direction or the other, you lose the sounding point. It will take a lot of practice. It's very much like riding a bike. The first few times you're going to fall off, but after a while, it will all click into place. You'll have the right balance and be able to move back and forth, down bow and up bow. As long as you don't move the bow too quickly and you maintain that beautiful straight angle halfway between the bridge and the fingerboard. So that was a lot of information for our first lesson. I can leave you with a couple of tips to make the process even easier. The first involves changing the angle to get different strings. We were on the E string but if you raise your elbow, you'll hit the A string. Raise it too much, and you'll actually hit the D string as well. If you don't raise it enough, you'll still be hitting the E and the A together. So that involves a little bit of practice. The other hint I can give you is about trying to maintain that straight line parallel to the bridge. If you actually feel like you're pulling a little bit out on your down bows and a little bit in on your up bows, 
you have much more of a chance of producing a straight line. I'm pushing out, but to you it probably looks straight. And now I'm pulling in. The reason for this is because our arms want to move in an arc. But if we do that with the bow, again, we're going to have the bow sliding all over the place and losing the sounding point. So that was an awful lot of information for one lesson. Remember, it's all about experimentation and practice. I've spent my entire life practicing the violin, trying every day to produce a better and better sound. Don't get discouraged. There's no such thing really as a bad sound. Even if you squeak or you're playing too loud or you're playing too soft, these are all effects that you'll be able to use later. So none of your effort is wasted. In the meantime, I hope these tips were helpful. Happy experimentation, and I hope you have tons of fun learning to play the violin.